Today is Friday, May 31st, 2024. You have found the Living Youth Podcast. My name is John Robinson. I'm here once again with my podcast co-host and partner. Not in that way. Mr. Wallace Smith. <laughs> oh, man. Good good job making it awkward. Uh, it's partly on our minds because we heard that tale, right, of a fellow who it was at a Starbucks or something, and the person said, oh, and what does your partner want? Yes. And he said, no, this is my wife. I'm yes. not going to put up with that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, how are you? I'm doing fine. Hey, Mr. Uh, Robinson. Doing great. All, all of a sudden, this kind of like last gasp of spring where the weather's cooled off a bit and a little bit is really nice it's uh, an good. ideal temperature and it's been a productive week uh, we've got oh, yeah. the magazine out to reviewers the autobiography is being reviewed so it's it's been a good week and but it's nice to be it's nice that it's friday looking forward to the sabbath and that will generate at least one email asking about the autobiography <laughs> hey we're excited about it we're looking forward to getting it out and it's uh it is it's going through some final reviews some neat pictures so anyway look forward to getting it out so this uh this morning we're in uncharted territory We've had episode 100 under our belt. That's right. Gotten some good feedback on that, by the way. Episode 101, we've entered the, the triple digits. What is our topic for today? Our topic today, it might seem old, and we not only could we have talked about it earlier, we could have talked about it with Mr. Weston. I think he would have loved, loved this topic. But we want to talk about the commencement speech that Mr. Harrison Butker gave at Benedictine College. You've probably heard some things about it. If you haven't, you need to have. If you have, you need the full story because we are going to say some things that perhaps other people aren't saying. Right. So uh, anyway, that's well, our topic today. Mr. Smith, tell me when we come back from the break why we should care about Mr. Butker's commencement speech. I'll tell you what. I'll do my best to do just that. Smith. Welcome back. And Mr. Robinson ended things with a good question. So why should we even care about this speech? This was a kicker from the Kansas City Chiefs. Is that correct there, Mr. Robinson? Yes. I, I will be completely leaning on Mr. John Robinson for my sports knowledge for the sake of this podcast. So uh, 28-year-old kicker. How long has he been with them, Mr. Robinson? Do you have any idea? No, that's a good question. He's th This is at least um, five or six years. Okay. He's been wow. So a few yeah. trips to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. right. He's got a couple of rings. Oh, oh, very nice. Okay, so here we have uh, a young Catholic man, which we'll figure into uh, our discussion. And he was asked, he'd given, I don't know if it was a commencement speech, but he gave a speech someplace else and got some attention. And then Benedictine College, which is a, um, I think in Kansas, just a, a Catholic private university in Kansas, had asked him to give the commencement address to their graduates. He did so. And just caused a wave of controversy. I would say not just controversy. Some of the support that he was given, I thought, came from interesting backgrounds. People who often complain about things that are "quote unquote" conservative mm -hmm. actually defended. Hey, look, he ought to be—he ought to be able to say what he what he thinks and such. Did he cause liberal tears? <laughs> he did cause some, absolutely. In fact, a, a giant petition saying the Kansas City Chiefs should uh, should fire him. And, and re actually one, at least one was that fire him and replace him with a woman, you know, kicker, which part of me deep down wishes they would do just to, just to, to see yeah. the results of such yeah. things. But, but, but those things said it, it touched on many nerves of our culture and it was different. It wasn't some say, uh, you know, people often say, oh, those Republicans say they just will try to control our bodies and we're women and, and here's this or all this, this old idea, all these old ideas, they just need to die. And yet here was a young, uh, vibrant, you know, healthy 28 year old famous person who was saying these ideas that are considered so out of date and was, was mm -hmm. being quite countercultural, if you will, in his address and which is important to recognize was super well received. Not not everybody in the crowd uh, yeah. agreed, but at the same time, yeah. most of them, both men and women, did. And it's worthwhile talking about what he got right. Uh, it's worthwhile talking about what he got wrong. And then, if you happen to read the commentary I wrote about it, I think I wrote about it on the Living Youth website as well, but we will need to post the actual full commentary that we wrote. Uh, some things that there's a fun, there's a, a prophetic aspect yep. to what he said. So uh, there's a lot of reasons to pay attention. Yeah. You know, I went back and read your commentary. I, I didn't even know you had written it actually. So what, what does that say about <laughs> me? But actually 
really well written, easy read. And I, I do really recommend that if you want to just get a, a quick kind of up to speed of it, and, well, actually listen to this podcast, but otherwise listen <laughs> or go read the commentary because it's really quite good. And one, and I actually went back and watched the commencement speech and I'm really glad I did because I had underestimated a couple things. I had underestimated how Catholic he was, mm. you know, if he, he's not, he's not like Catholic by birth. And, you know, once a year he goes, you, you know, on Christmas to the Christmas mass or whatever, Easter and all that. No, he's like a pretty, pretty serious Catholic and takes it seriously. And he was addressing a very Catholic audience. So a lot of his comments made sense because of that. Um, though, you know, it's, you know, it's going to get publicized and, and he certainly, he did get criticism for it. You know, it's one thing I read one, one commentary on it where they also did not know sports and they were commenting on it and they're like, well, there's been some pressure to get rid of him. I hope he's a good kicker. And <laughs> and having followed the sports, I was like, oh, he is a very good kicker. I actually just <laughs> looked it up. He has a nearly 90% career success rate, which is pretty high. And he's actually seven years that he's been a pro and he has three uh, Super Bowl rings. So yeah, wow, that probably helps. If he, if he was like a, a marginal kicker, they might've moved on from him, but no, he's a, he's a good kid. That's okay. That, that's helpful to know because I, in the commentary, which we hope you all read, I, I will do my best to remember to put the link on livingyouth.org. But I tried to make a, I tried to make some sportsy statement at the beginning saying that, well, boy, uh, the Kansas city chiefs, uh, Harrison Butker, uh, gave a speech at this college and he stirred up, uh, more controversy than, uh, a kicker who missed a 20 year of football, you know, <laughs> the, the f- f- field goal and, uh, not football field goal, but, I. I I was trying to think actually from an editorial perspective, this kind of stuff you don't think of, how do I weave in that he's a kicker or something also and kind of get right. all that information in the beginning right. without having to, yeah. to go to it. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. there was that, but okay, that, 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 that's actually really good to know. It makes sense. He's got a bit of celebrity and in, in the speech, he actually refers to his teammates, girlfriend, mm-hmm. which is hilarious because of course he's talking about Travis Kelsey and he's talking about uh, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Yeah. Thank you. I actually was, believe it or not, I'm about to forget her name, but it was funny that he did that, which only, brought up the ire of a lot of, oh boy, well, she sure wouldn't go for that. Or, you know, how, how dare he use this quote from her song or whatever. But it really was a, let me just say, a, taking out what we will say about it being prophetic or mm-hmm. what's right or wrong. It was actually a, a good, solid speech. He's a very good public speaker. I'm assuming he wrote it all himself. He's a very good public speaker, I would say. He he seemed to have a sense of, 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 of how to say things, his timing. Mm-hmm. And in terms of if you, if you take away some of the religious aspects, the, the values he put across mm-hmm. definitely yep. spot on. Now he did read his entire speech. Oh yeah. But, and, but I, you know, if you, if you really look at a lot of speakers, that's actually not so unusual so, for yeah. commencements and such. Yeah. I think when Jerry Seinfeld gave his recently, that was so contra- he said nothing controversial, but you had a lot of people try to walk out because of the whole Israel Gaza thing. I think a lot of his was more, was a little more off the cuff and some I'm starting to look and I don't know if they're starting to do the, uh, Oh, the, um, yeah, uh, the, um, I use a teleprompter, teleprompter where you, where you look through the two teleprompters on either side. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to see that. I think that maybe some of these presenters are using that, that tech because it's Mm -hmm. really advanced regardless. It was a good presentation. Uh, and let's, let's just jump right into it. And and by the way, we will also include, I say we will, I'm going to do my best if I, if you go out there and, and you don't see it, let me know. Uh, the commentary should have these links, but we'll also add on livingyouth.org a link to his speech. It's just the speech, not a lot of commentary. You can actually listen to the speech and also a link on the Nath- National Catholic Register where you can read the speech if you don't want to do it because you don't, some context would be helpful. You won't, yeah. you won't have to listen to it to get what we're going to say today, I think, but, but it would be helpful if you haven't seen it. I, I recommend because I you sent me the text of it and I and I read a part of it. I it's best consumed by watching the video, in mm, my opinion. Interesting, because it, it just kind of brings it to life in, in a way that the transcript doesn't. Okay, so what did Mister Butker get right we, well, that we would agree with broadly? Yeah. Okay. What 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 exactly? So what what were the things that we really that was exciting to hear a a young man talk about publicly? To this crowd, uh, well, several things. One, he called out uh, evil for what it was. Uh, mm-hmm. He straight up, like I, he, he talked to, to men and said they need to embrace being masculine mm-hmm. and not let this culture's, yep. uh, uh, I was going to make up a word, dirtification. Uh, I just made that up, but 
you can use it if you want. Anyway, this, this culture is degrading of the idea of what it means to be masculine, not, not to let that stop you from actually being masculine, but he, I would say he was even stronger when it comes to women. And he said, I think I got the quote somewhere when he told the ladies, oh boy, what is it? Um, I'll find it. Give me just a second. Oh, when he, when he talked about being homemakers. Well, yeah, and he said he said something about uh, to women what what society has uh, has said about them. Uh, and oh, here we go. I got the quote. He said, "For the ladies present today, uh, congratulations on an amazing accomplishment. You know, in terms of graduating from Benedictine College, you should be proud of all that you've achieved to this point in your young lives. I want to speak directly to you briefly because I think it is you, the women." who have had the most diabolical lies told to you. And I thought, well, how great to hear someone call out the fact that our culture is not just simply has different ideas about womanhood, but is literally lying to women. It is literally leading them down a terrible and self-destructive path. And of course he threw in the word diabolical. Again, we'll get into the religious aspects, but that diabolical tends to include a sense of demonic, right? But yep. for him to call out those things as the evil they are, it was it was great. It was great yep. to hear it just so blatantly put. Yeah, he and he he did a couple of things that was interesting to me. Um, he he alluded to what I can't remember if he said this or this is my characterization. Like we're going back and looking at the notes, but kind of the culture of death that's marked by um, abortion. Like he called out abortion very clearly. And I forget how cle- clear the. Catholic stance is on abortion. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it is. So he called out the pres- president Biden who is Catholic and is at times embraced being Catholic yet at the same time he believes women shouldn't be able to have abortion. So he kind of called out the contradiction there. Yeah, he did. He said, uh, and again, this will be very Catholic in aspect of this, but he said about that, our own nation is led by a man who publicly and proudly proclaims his Catholic faith, but at the same time is delusional enough to make the sign of the cross during a pro abortion rally. He had said that things, he, he made a list. He said things like abortion, IVF, which the Catholic Church also generally stands against, uh, I believe. Uh, surrogacy, you know, paying women to have your babies as homosexual couples, et cetera. Euthanasia, which some would, would say euthanasia is where someone doesn't participate in their, in their own mercy killing, but at the same time, that culture. Mm-hmm. They said as well as a growing support for degenerate cultural yes. val- values yep. and media all stem from the pervasiveness of disorder. Yeah. Not words you're used to a kicker no. on, a, on, no. a, on a pro football no. team saying. And, and actually, I really, I, I, I mean, perhaps somebody could point out a flaw in this, but I mean, like, in general, I think he's made the right call. And, and I would agree with that, with where we are um, in society right now. And he also expressed clear support for traditional biblical gender roles he did he yeah yeah he did and the other thing he did that i thought this would get more so of all the heat that he took it seems like that some called him out more for supporting women being homemakers which will i think we'll come back to that more mm-hmm. but also that he said you know and uh what I wish, how did he phrase it you know talking about people being proud of their behavior so much that we've dedicated a whole month to it and it was a no, not a thinly veiled you're right. criticism of the LGBT community it's, in Pride Month. You're, you're, he did do that. He, I think it was where he was talking about, he was trying to encourage them to be proud of being Catholic. You know, but he said, but not not a sinful kind of pride, right. like the one that has a whole month yeah. devoted to it. But yeah, absolutely calling that out, yeah. that, was, that was fantastic to hear. The part that he said about the mother, he said that... Um, uh, and, and, and there are subtle Catholicisms that are in terms of doctrine that's woven into this position, but it, it doesn't really come out until other parts. He says, I can tell you that my beautiful wife, Isabel, would be the first to say that her life truly started when she began living her vocation as a wife and as a mother. I'm on the stage today and able to be the man I am because I have a wife who leans into her vocation. And he got emotional. Oh, he did. Yeah. Yeah. He he chokes up at the very end. He says, I'm on stage. Oh, I said that I'm beyond blessed with the many talents God has given me, but it cannot be overstated that all of my success is made possible because a girl I met in band class back in middle school would convert to the faith. That was important to him, uh, become my wife and embrace one of the most important titles of all homemaker. 
And then the National, National Catholic Register knows that he got applause for 18 seconds at that. I counted it, and I didn't get 18 seconds. Okay, me too. I thought they were fudging a bit, but I, if when I included a little bit of this is the kind of nerdy thing we'll do, I'm going to time that and see if it's 18 seconds. Uh, to me, when I included a little bit of the beginning of the applause and then also how the applause kind of tapered a bit into mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. to me, it, it, I think it did come out to be mm-hmm. around 18 seconds. But regardless, it was a good quarter yeah. minute. It was. Yeah. And the important thing is, this was a this is a bunch of college graduates, men and women. I know this particular commentary writer for The Guardian. I might have even linked to her in the commentary. Oh, she was appalled. She said that the speech means the bigots are winning, you know, and she was just and knowing this particular writer didn't surprise me at all. She just launched into that and she said, oh, just imagine being some young woman there, you know, being told, hey, I know you've worked hard on a degree to guess what, you know, it's a, you really should be a mother or something, you, you know, you should you're going to be a wife. Well, and she said, I think she had a comment from maybe a young woman who didn't like the speech. I can't recall. But even she admitted that that both men and women were applauding that statement, right? It's for it's like she doesn't just want to reject that idea that it's believe it or not, it is super valuable to yeah. be a wife and a homemaker, and that is a remarkable calling. But like she's upset that even that women in the audience would even think that, yeah. right? That they yeah. would actually dare to yeah. applaud about that. Well, that's because we're literally living in the Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> and they're just a, a accepted their role in the patriarchal tyranny, you know. But oh, the, like joking aside, I'm just being funny there what i what's interesting to me about this and others have noted this this is not a new observation is how every one of these things that he pointed out in general well with some exceptions i guess up until the last 20 years 10 years was not controversial and was widely accepted right right oh that's that's a great point to make mr robinson and you have in our notes which which as we wrap up what he got right uh and uh and i want to actually want to highlight Some of you listening went to the L4T this past weekend, and if you did, some of this might be old hat because what we're doing now, we're already planning this podcast. Apparently, they did at L4T. They actually watched the speech together, and everybody talked about that. So just so you know, thanks for listening anyway. uh, Hopefully, we're saying things that resonate with what you said. Maybe we'll add some things you didn't say, but also let me use it as an opportunity to highlight the value of the L4T opportunities that whenever, uh, whenever they do show up. Uh, on your schedules, if you can make an opportunity, to, uh, make the time to be out there. I keep misusing the word opportunity, Mr. Robinson. If you make the time to be out there and go to those, I would highly encourage them because that that also caught their attention and they did the same thing we're doing here. One of the things he highlighted too, which is frankly prophesied, no matter which party gets in charge, is poor leadership. You know, he was he was willing to talk about the 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 COVID years. He was talking mm-hmm. to these students, saying, "Look, y'all, part of your time here suffered." for the leadership of our country and that didn't know how to handle all of these things. And he called out leadership in the Catholic church as well. He, and that's something that'll feed into the, I think the prophetic part later, but you know, the idea that all Catholics in the world just love the Pope and they love what he's doing and they love all these decisions. They don't, there is a ton of Catholics that are frustrated by what they believe is a super liberal Pope and frustrated by the compromises they see, even if it's all kind of snarkily worded. And he, he, without disrespecting the Catholic Church, which we'll get into, he still kind of called that stuff he, out. Yeah, you're right. He really walked a line on that. And that's one of the things that walked the line between being critical of clearly not all, right? Catholic leadership, you know, specifically, he didn't name the names of priests, but specifically saying priests and others, while at the same time, clearly, clearly fully supporting the Catholic Church and that God founded it and that you know and he's <laughs> we'll running. get to that right yeah right. we'll get to it you know but the like despite the fallibility of these men the catholic church is still you know being used by god for for great things that's but, what he said yeah right. that's what he said yeah i was afraid a little sound bite someone's gonna take oh, a sound yeah. bite and say oh look at robinson he, yeah he's i can't a, wait secret catholic until you, and it'd probably be more, far more likely to be you i can't wait till we run into the first ai generated wally oh, smith heresy man. let's video. not even let's yeah. not even give the the evil world ideas <laughs> but you know it's gonna happen but that it so I think because I've grown up in the church culture and we're so, some things are so emphasized and like respect for leadership and everything. I was really surprised by how openly critical he was of their church leadership. You know, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that the, the other day, because it was a bit of a revelation to me. And, and this also, this, like I said, some of this ties into the prophecy part, but it was a bit of a revelation to me that, that, 
it's too easy to mischaracterize and to misunderstand, because I did, uh, the relationship between what it means for the Pope in according to Catholic dogma for him to be considered, we, we, we say too easily, always right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really, it's a very technical doctrine that, he, that, that what he says, ex cathedra, meaning sitting in the chair, so to speak, that is in his official position for setting doctrine for the church, their idea is that it's always that God will always guide it to be 100% accurate all the time. And we've sometimes, and it's not wrong to highlight this, it really does wake some people up, but we've often highlighted, man, look at history, look at some of these popes. Some of them were womanizers and brutal and murderers and all these, all these terrible crimes and sins. But to think that that somehow dissuades the real Catholics who know their stuff, it doesn't. And of, of all things, the place I saw it was, was flipping through channels years. Just saying flipping through channels tells you how old it is. Um, it was a EWTN, I think, a Catholic network. You know, it's kind of like a, whatever that one is for, for evangelicals, mm-hmm. but it was a Catholic yeah, network. The, um, 700 it, Club? it was kind of like, kind of like, like that, that, but okay. yeah, but this was for Catholics and, and it was a priest. No, I don't know if he's a priest or just like a lay minister, but he was speaking with a nun, I guess, whatever show they were hosting. And he was totally referring to all these bad popes in the past. He, he didn't have any problem recognizing those, but he instead turned that around as proof. I, I say proof in quotes. It's not proof, but he was saying that's, evidence of how how Christ guides our church because even when you have these terrible corrupt men that have found their way to this place through political shenanigans whatever every time they spoke from the chair so to speak ex cathedra God never let them even in their vileness say something yeah. that would harm the church it would still be true doctrine yeah. now of course it's not true doctrine you know a lot of the time it's not it's it's heresy we know that however and plus when your doctrine is it's going to be correct well then you're stuck with it forever so of course you you know you make it work but they, yeah they they recognize that and he exactly kind of openly spoke about that and even realized even amongst their priests they disagree with each other you'll see the the bishops will send some nasty letter mm-hmm. about something a leadership in some synod you know concluded so it was interesting to see him say that because it's a kind of reminder that it's far it's such a huge it's, it's literally a billion plus people you're looking at maybe two billion people on the planet and and the priesthood that supports that it's it's very much like a, a nation spread out amongst the nations and like any other nation there's going to be internal criticism in a very interesting way it yeah. was interesting i think that's a, i'm glad you made that point because i think that's so important in understanding the catholic mindset because you you do you can you, history clearly records some pretty not good people as the pope and you're like, well, what about that? Like, how do, how can how can you believe that Catholicism is any kind of like, well, that's that's how that's the mindset. Like, yeah, sure, we've had our problems, but God has always that's you know been right. there. Is it's the a, is the chair the Holy See? Uh, it's sort of, okay. sort of. It's a little, it's a little weird. Uh, you know what? Actually, the CGP Gray video yeah. goes into all that stuff. Yeah, really yeah, well. that's what I was thinking of. Videos. It's funny because in one sense, like like legally, like human legally. Um, the Holy See is the chair, and the chair is in charge of the Catholic Church. <laughs> yes, it is interesting. Uh, it, it's helpful as young individuals, our teens and young adults there in the audience, that you know don't just fall into quick oversimplifying traps. We'll get into the the Catholic Church. We do believe that the counterfeit Christianity that will eventually pro- is prophesied to rise is that the form you see it in today is the Catholic church. We're being up front. doesn't mean that every Catholic is an evil person. Just like, doesn't mean all of us are good people, but in terms of the false religion, yes. If you have not read our booklet on Satan's counterfeit Christianity, we're not saying anything new here, but sometimes you think, Oh, you know, you guys, you just, you just think every, every Pope is perfect, never makes mistakes. But if they know their stuff, they'll push back and say, oh, that's not true. Man, there's some terrible popes, you know. So we have to be careful over simplifying and make sure we focus on what we know and what is what is and what is true. So you might know some and have those conversations. Yeah, be careful about that. I, it, it caught me off when I was younger talking with a Catholic person and realized, OK, I, I need to be careful because I'm, I'm throwing things out like I know what I'm talking about when I when I don't always. So as he outlined all these things that are problems that we would broadly agree with. He also began to kind of pivot towards sort of his solution in it. <laughs> and his solution is where we begin to disagree with him. What, uh, I would say so. Yeah. What did you, what did you note first of all with Mr. Butker's speech that jumped out to you? Like, Oh, we've kind of, uh, we've, we've kind of pivoted and we're into things that are 
would sound like a good solution to many, but you know, it's interesting because whether it was a pivot, it, it, it wasn't maybe as obvious, uh, definitely in early parts, but after a while it was kind of intertwined and he yeah. wouldn't just talk about, you know, something without bringing up the other, but in terms of this overall thing, what does Mr. Butker get wrong? Uh, it is not just a, a speech about, uh, how do I word it in the commentary? I think it wasn't just about traditional values mm-hmm. or for that matter, I would even say biblical mm-hmm. values. It mm-hmm. was a speech about Catholic yeah. values. Or even he, I, I thought that too. Like he didn't say Christian values. It was, these are Catholic. And values. it's so easy. I mean, we have listeners all over the world. We appreciate all of you. In fact, I looked, it's actually quite a number of countries. We will uh, mention that one day, but as an American, where say Protestantism and beyond just Protestantism, evangelicalism and the rest has a, has a very large presence. It's easy to forget that for most of the rest of the world, the word Catholic and Christian are virtually the same. Right. right. And we, we, we can forget that I'd say so easily, but really too easily. And so when we're talking about, when we say the word Christian here and there outside, not everywhere outside the U S but in many places, then you're, they're thinking Catholic. And so for him to say the Catholic church or the church, whatever, it's, it's all the same. And he, it was, it was a full throated defense of not even just Catholicism, but hardcore yeah. Catholicism. Like I, the, the Catholics, I would say in his speech, he was more Catholic than the Pope. Uh, I thought he was, he was just very, very yeah. Catholic. Well, the, so what I, I noticed, in fact, I went back and looked it up again. One of the things that struck me and I, I didn't, I don't even, I'm not even sure this is that significant, but he didn't just say, let, let's, uh, you know, a call to embrace traditional Catholic values. No, it was very specifically Roman Catholic values. And there was something about that. And I think the rest of the speech bears this out. Like he's not talking about being better Catholics. He's talking about, you know, embracing original Roman. We'll get into it. Like what well, the evidence of it, but like, again, this is not, not like, let's just be better Catholics. It's like, no, specifically Roman Catholic values. And that there is a, seems to be a meaning to that. Yes. Cause, and, and, and where is he coming from? He wouldn't necessarily put it quite that way, but he did say, in fact, I'm, I'm almost certain I can find the quote. So give me a second. We, we should have all this. Yeah. He said, he says a paragraph. He says, never, this is not me. This is Mr. Butker. Never be afraid to profess the one holy Catholic and apostolic church for this is the church that Jesus Christ mm-hmm. established through which we receive sanctifying grace. That is your your hardcore Catholic position that this is the church that Jesus started. Now we know if you don't know that, you need to look into it. We will I'll I'll have a link. If you haven't read a booklet in ages, you're thinking, oh, booklets are for older people. I will give you a link to the Satan's Counterfeit Christianity or grab it off of your your bookshelf at home, but you really do need to read that because no, the Roman Catholic Church is not that church. It is the church that apostatized. In fact, it's fascinating. I saw a graphic. I saved it. I'll share it with you, Mr. Robinson. It was uh, from a, a Catholic person on Twitter somewhere. In fact, that is a passionate community out there. A lot of the people driving the pushback against wokeism and stuff, when you look at their religious ties, a lot of them are Catholic. And there was this image, and it was essentially supposed to be like a family tree of what's called a Christian, quote unquote. And they have at the very top, at the very beginning, like, you know, right there that Jesus Christ founded uh, Catholicism, the, the Catholic Church, that's the, which the word Catholic just means universal. Mm-hmm. That's what they're saying, the universal church. And then they have all these branches and all the people splitting. But the guy's point was, if you're going to be a part of anything, why wouldn't you be a part of the right. thing? But here's what's fascinating. Because we know in the Old Testament early on, they did have to wrestle with those they called uh, Judaizers, right? Those that were trying to keep the faith within Judaism when Jesus Christ had had expanded the law. You know, it was different. you didn't have to obey all these rules, all these different kind of things that weren't biblical. Well, even in their chart, it's so funny because the very first division they list is off to the side and there's no other things from it. It's just off to the side and that's it. And it's uh, Judaizers. And I realize, yeah, they've got those things backwards. That's, they're calling that us, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're calling us that. And, and it reminded me, this is the reverse, but it reminded me, it's not Catholicism as the Jews, uh, a, a Jewish rabbi, I believe that a guy I knew in the church a long time ago 
was had a had an acquaintance. They were getting to know each other, and the fellow was a very educated uh, rabbi, I think. And he said, "Well, I'm really interested. What what is your church like? What is your what is your faith?" Uh, and so, as my friend kept describing it, you're keeping the Sabbath and the law, but without you know the things that Judaism added and such. The the Jewish rabbi fellow was listening and listening. He finally said, "Oh." Yeah, we thought we got ready, you guys. You know, oh, we thought, you know, he thought oh, we got we thought amazing. we got ready, you guys, wow. yeah, all those centuries ago. And it's the same thing. So in their in their world, we're the ones that departed trying to cling to to the law. When it's re- in reality, no, they were the early split. They were the Gnostic, you know, adders of things, you mm-hmm. know, gone. So so when he's talking about that, he feels he is defending the church that Jesus Christ founded. And as a result, he says things, and I, I love the one that, that you noted here. Uh, that he says, he says, tells them that, hey, you're a part of the Catholic faith, and the Catholic faith has always been countercultural. Yes. Yeah. But it hasn't been, right? No, not at all. That that was a very ironic statement. Um, I also might add that, uh, I, I don't think you've mentioned this in, with what you just said, but this always still took me by surprise, because when I, this is, uh, man, 20, 25 years ago, and it was this guy I played basketball with, and um, we started talking about Sabbath and Sunday and turned out he was Catholic. And I was like, Oh, so you don't mind if we play basketball on Sunday instead of Saturday. Anyway, you come to find out this is the first time I'd ever heard this. I didn't know that, mm. that, um, Oh no, I believe Catholic Catholicism is the one true church. And Peter was the first Pope and it was founded on him. And, you know, if you ever go, I know a lot of people have heard of it, the Bible study. Yeah. The transcripts and stuff. Yeah, of Mr. Ogwin's yeah. uh, Bible studies. Right. If you if you read his one on Romans, um, he goes and takes a lot of time and appropriately so showing how Peter was never in Rome and uh, and all that kind of thing. That's important to know. So I guess I'm, what I'm trying to clarify for like younger listeners, why would you know what the Catholics think? Because right. you grow up in the church and you know the truth. But the Catholics really believe that Peter went over to Rome at some point and founded the church because they 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 take the um, the scripture that says you are you are Peter. And on this rock, you're founded. I'm not quoting this correctly, right? No, yeah. Whatever, after Peter confesses, he says, you know, now I declare you are Peter. Uh, and, and the word means rock. It's not the same rock where he says in a moment, and on this rock, which isn't right. the man, Peter. Actually, Jesus Christ is the rock, but that declaration of truth. He says, uh, I will build my church yeah. and the gates of hell will not yeah. prevail against it. Mark, right. uh, Matthew 16, 18. And so there's a word play there with little rock, big rock. But anyway, they just take it as... Peter was used to build the rock, which was the Catholic church. And he's the first Pope. And there's been a succession of Popes ever since him, you know, all the way down to right. Francis. That's their claim. Yeah. That's their claim. I think yeah. it's helpful to know that it is. Uh, by the way, do you know their argument when you bring up the difference in the rocks? I heard no, it on, the, I think that. that same broadcast of the, the fellow talking okay. to the nun, they would highlight not necessarily inaccurately that that conversation didn't probably happen in Greek. It probably happened in Aramaic. And in Aramaic, there are not two different words. It's kefa and kefa. That's why we see cephas or, or kef. Okay. However, as we say with a lot of other things, that's fine. But what did God choose to inspire it to be recorded for all time in? He chose to have it inspired in Greek to be recorded. And in Greek, you can make a distinction that you're not required to make. So regardless of whether they were speaking Aramaic in that point, it's irrelevant. It was recorded for us in sacred scripture, in Greek, where the distinction is clearly being made by the author, well, by the writer in that case. So anyway, just in case you're curious, yep. that's, yeah. that's the argument that comes up. You know, going, but coming back to the observation about the Catholic faith being counterculture, you know, the claim, like, his claim, that his it claim, is, right? yeah. You know, uh, um, this is a theme I haven't heard talked about in a while, but like, you know, when you go really, really big picture, there's certain themes that emerge, and one of them was sort of like a tale of two cities. You know, there's Jerusalem and there's Babylon, and oh, there's just yeah, yeah. always been two ways. You know, there's God's way, and then there's the way of Cain. Just always these two ways, right? And so, it's when you keep that in mind, it's not difficult to go. Well, let's evaluate this claim that Catholic <laughs> is counterculture. You right. know, and but then you look at their foundations and what they are like, like. So much of their of their culture is a pagan culture, and if you were really going to correctly define Catholicism, which would be difficult because they are such a mix of ideas, it's fundamentally a Gnostic religion more than anything else. 
Uh, but but what else? Uh, it's I don't think it's difficult to disprove. It wasn't founded on Peter and Christ. Right. And oh, and about the countercultural thing, I'll highlight. If if you're looking at the current wave, because this will feed into the prof- prophetic thoughts later, it, it is kind of countercultural in the sense that currently. Like the world is, is we have all these people don't want babies, right? We have fewer and fewer babies being born. The Catholic church says, man, have lots of babies, right? You should really do that. Uh, the world is trying to be kind of atheistic and they're saying, no, get in and listen to the mass and be a part. You could say and, uh, abortion. It's like, no, it's, they don't even, they're not even, they're even anti any kind of birth control, right? They're very extreme in that regard. Well, the thing is, he said it's always been countercultural, but no, the whole reason it, what you're saying, it came into the shape it is is because of all the compromises with the culture it made in the past. Why is it Sunday instead of Saturday? Mm -hmm. Why is Christmas so filled with pagan symbolism? Why is Easter itself timed the way it is? When you, why, why is the mass, uh, actually a parallel of uh, ancient pagan rituals? And there's even, at least there's one letter. I have to find it again. There's a book I have that Barna published where it's a letter from a Pope where he, the Pope, and this is a long time ago is in, is telling directly, Hey, use some of the culture there, uh, in a way to win mm-hmm. converts. Right. Now it's one thing to understand the culture, but to adopt pagan practices and replace the faith with that is, is, is violating God's will. And yet the, the, the cult, the, uh, Right, the, the symbolism, the practices, so much of the traditions that you see in the Roman Catholic Church grew out of not being counterculture, but doing its best to mimic the culture to help bring more people in. So that's, that's the, the, the subtlety. You bet. If you were to be a modern uh, Catholic, you're going to go against a lot of the, today's modern culture. But the idea that the church that that church has always been countercultural just isn't just isn't factual. It's yeah. not. And I, sure, it ran up against the Romans here and there, and it ran up against things. But at the same time, it also adopted a lot of that. And so, the, I I can understand why he's trying to claim it's counterculture because of what it, what is going on here. And this this is probably a little early to get into this because it kind of turns more to what's potentially prophetic. But I mean, there has been a cultural perversion with the whole pressing of the lbgtqi sure. plus culture this idea that we can change genders all these kind of things and you know you and i have noticed for some time now that late that you go and look at some of the voices that are pushing back on this agenda have been often catholic voices yes and so they really can present themselves as being countercultural in that sense right now Right. And that, and that seems to be what Mr. Butker is referring to. Yes. But and then you have what we have to look at carefully is are they truly standing for only biblical values? Remember, the counterfeit Christianity is not in every way the opposite of Christianity. It is a mix. Mm-hmm. It's always mm-hmm. been a mix. What what God looks at as spiritual adultery is not just completely doing the opposite of everything, but mixing it with the other. And that's what they have done. So you can be excited about certain ideas, but then you look and there's a little bit of the the, the perversion. They use a, a kind of bread and wine in their mass. But is that the same as we do? No, it's one, it's not the Passover. It's not celebrated even at the same time. Uh, you look at the how it's what well, the it's considered to be the actual in a miraculous way flesh and blood of Jesus when the law clearly says don't eat people right? it doesn't say in those words but no you don't actually eat human flesh for Jesus Christ to have been telling them hey eat this is literally like it's my flesh in this and you're going to eat it right now he would have been sinning because he would have been telling them actually to commit sin so it's it's this weird mixture that they have, and it's always been that way. And that's why we can be so sympathetic with a speech like his when he's preaching against the the hedonism of our current culture. Right. The, the, the irony of us, in some ways, actually rooting the Catholics on as they <laughs> as they push back against some of the more right. obviously, um, I'll just use the word, the demented ideas that are that are going on out there. And we can at least appreciate they're like, hey, that's not a great idea, right? But yet, what do they want to replace it with? Well, it, is, it sounds really good until you get in details like this yep. and realize, oh, wait, they want to replace it with, yep. with their, their version of Christianity, which is a counterfeit. And yep. if you look at the second beast in Revelation 13, he's described as looking like a lamb 
but sounding like the serpent. Yep. And that's where you, you've got to be careful and distinguish. You know, I like the point you made in the commentary where you, you point out that, you know, and I've heard others say this, I won't mention any names, uh, public comment, public commentators. Um, just truly, if you, if you call some of this cultural stuff that's going on right now, it's, it's, it's hedonism and it's, and it's celebrated. And so there's a lot of relatively normal people that recognize that's not great, but at the same time, switching from satanically inspired hedonism to Satan's counterfeit Christianity. Also, I, I would argue that technically that would be something of an improvement, but like it certainly doesn't fix the problem, and it, it's there's still a long term issue. Oh yeah, well that's the point. I I, I sometimes have in discussion with people. Sometimes people are so we're we're all it's devastating to see what's happening to our own culture and to to values today, and so we can get real sympathetic with some politicians on one side of the aisle or the other, but usually it's more one than the other, and like oh no that's a real God fearing person he wants to do this and wants to do that or. It's like, well, wait a minute, but really take the time to think about what it is that, that they want. How do we get here? Reverting to even the, uh, like, look at our founding fathers in the United States. I'm speaking as an American. Our founding fathers, a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of them definitely had a stronger religious sense. They believed that God was real and they believed God expected things of them. But it wasn't what we would call the true faith. It was the equivalent of, if it wasn't the harlot of revelation. It was the harlot daughters. It was, it was the Protestant strains. It was those that emerged from that, which were still a mix of truth and error. And to simply go back to that just means we'll give it time and the error continues to grow. You can trace everything, all the stuff that's going wrong today to an unwillingness to hew completely to what God says and how God guides including going all the way back to the Catholic Church, because how did Protestant even, Protestantism, Protestantism even start? Well, you've got Luther and, and others, but Luther, read Dr. Meredith's book on it, who notices, hey, this isn't right, this isn't good. And so, yet you've already been set free a bit from the Bible to come up with your own things, and it's all been a mix that goes all the way back. So the idea of, this is terrible, let's go back to the tainted religion that's at the origin of all these mistakes anyway, that's, that's just no solution. <clears throat> I think we're getting ready to move to our next point. And, and um, there's a quote in here that I want to read that I thought was absolutely fascinating. And I put it under the, what we think he gets wrong idea. Okay. So here's how I interpret it. Well, no, I'll read it. Then I'll say kind of how I interpret it. And then you're, you're good at looking at like another way he could have meant it. Or, okay. Or, wait, sure. Uh, okay. So one of the things he said, and I went back and listened to it a couple of times so I could type it out. He said to the audience, it is not prudent as the laity for us to consume ourselves in becoming amateur theologians so that we can decipher this or that theological teaching. And so when I read that, just if I just taking it at its face, I thought, oh yeah, um, absolute biblical, um, what's the word uh, that I want? Um, what's, what's, the, what's the word where you don't know anything? Uh, uh, ignorance? Uh, ignorance. Ignorance. Yeah. So it's, it sounds to me like he's calling for what I would argue is biblical ignorance in the sense that uh, let's not spend too much time, you know, studying the Bible and understanding doctrine because theological teaching would, would technically be doctrine. I do. Part of me does think that maybe he had something in mind that was kind of along the lines possibly of, hey, let's not overly criticize the priests and analyze everything they're saying kind of thing. But either way, to me, I interpret that as let's not get into the Bible and understand it better. It's like the opposite. Like it discourage. We're just the laity. We just need to listen to what the priests tell us. Yeah, it is interesting. I, I do, I do wonder exactly what he meant in that, but I think, I think you're definitely in the neighborhood of that because on one hand, is he, is he just making a, um, uh, like what is the soundest version of the point that he could be saying? The fact is some people will get so caught up in some abstract kind of idea or discussion to the point that they're busy fighting amongst themselves over something that isn't even something God wants to give us in any kind of detail. I gave a sermon just this past uh, Sabbath about getting caught up in ideas about God that can be so abstract and debated that it's like, well, God hasn't even bothered to reveal that in detail because it's not the most important thing about knowing him. But really, I do think that I think you're right on the money and that generally, and we've had, this is not just us making stuff up. We have had 
is so difficult because the Catholic Church is so large. You can have different ideas in different places. But we've had people come to us, come to the truth. God has opened their minds. And they will say they remember in their own lives being discouraged from reading the Bible. Yeah, right. It's just it's just confusing. It's just you know you're you're going to get it wrong. You know, don't do that. You know, just trust us and just and just not do that. Well, on one hand, God doesn't want any of us keeping our nose out of the Bible. Now, it is true that it's not meant to be this solo pursuit, and that's a mindset mm-hmm. that it's so easy to be tempted by. That you know what? It's me and God in the Bible. Mm-hmm. It's like no, it's not. God never inspired things for to be that way. We well, are part of a body. I we mean, have he, a leadership. He he commended the Bereans for being in the scriptures. Absolutely. Making sure that what they're being taught is true. But they were checking on mm-hmm. with what Paul was saying. Yeah. Absolutely. So it, there's always that role that we that we have there, but it is meant to be uh like I say it's it's not really a lone wolf exercise. It really is a group exercise. There's a reason we have a council of elders, there's a reason to this. But that said, it's interesting too, because as we'll get into, as we move into the prophetic, the p- potentially prophetic stuff, um, he does take issue. He is essentially acting a bit as an amateur theologian because he clearly disagrees with some of the trends that he has seen amongst their leadership, which is more liberalizing when it comes to Vatican II, which was a council many decades ago where they kind of opened up some possibilities for the church and who could be considered a Christian if you're not Catholic. Uh, you start to see where the mass, which is their their worship ritual, which really is supposed to be like a weird kind of sacrifice if you go into the details, even their own details, you look at it. But regardless, you go into the mass and how what well, didn't have to be in Latin all the time, which was kind of a hardcore tradition that, you know, we can do the mass in other languages. Well, he, he disagrees with, with a lot of that. He, he, he clearly is telling people, no, you need to go find a good priest who's doing, and you got to find the traditional Latin yeah, mass. Yeah. Well, in a sense, he is practicing armchair theology, but it's interesting. It's just, it's kind of like, okay, the Bible is what the Bible is, but then you go above that quote unquote to the Catholic doctrine. And that's where he's practicing it is in that. And, and that's where I think it's, it really is kind of strange. He's, yeah. he, he wants to say, Hey, let's not get caught up on these things. And yet he is caught up on those things that his own theologians around him that is in his, in his faith group would disagree with. So what is he telling them not to get caught up in? Well, it seems like he's saying don't get caught up in. I mean, really, the Bible seems Becoming like amateur what theologians. But I would argue any Christian ought to actually strive to be a, a quote unquote. It depends on what he means by theologian, right? And and Mr. Weston's really worked hard to warn us against uh, against that word in the sense of what it really. And actually, not just Mr. Weston. Mr. Nathan had that great sermon recently where he kind of talked about some of those things that. You know, theologian can just mean studier of God, right? You know, it's look at breakdown theologian. A person who engages or is an expert in theology. Ah, well, there you go. And really used to be like ambassador college. That's what you were getting your degree in. You Mm -hmm. know, technically it was theology. And yet at the same time, if you, if you take away the word and just think trying to know God, you know, what does Jesus Christ say in John? He says, this is eternal life. You know, know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So in that sense, if it's a matter of knowing God, well, then, of course, we're all right. doing that. And that definitely is something we individually invest mm-hmm. our time to pursue. So that's one of the things that struck me that went hand in hand with my my eyebrow raise over him admonishing the laity, in my opinion, to not study the Bible and understand doctrine. But I, that's probably not not exactly what he meant. But his heavy emphasis on the what he so he, he said what it was first, and then he referred to its acronym the whole rest of the way or. or was that an acronym or an abbreviation? TLM. So the traditional Latin mass, and you started calling initialism. It, I initialism. Think. Okay. See, I'm, even was wrong. Well, and I found an important sense that clarifies it. This is okay. maybe what you're saying because he, he he's saying that uh, he I think he's trying to focus them on their vocations as men and women and husbands and wives and not being distracted by the other things, and yet he does say still. After saying, let's not be able to be amateur theologians. Still, we have so many great resources at our fingertips that it doesn't take us long to find traditional and timeless teachings that haven't been ambiguously reworded for our times. Plus, there are still many good and holy priests, and it's up to us to seek them out. Well, the thing is, all the ambiguous wording he's talking about, which indeed is what you see what they're doing. They're trying to be very vague about things. But who's doing that? They're professional yeah. theologians, yeah. right? So yeah. so then what are you saying by yeah. dismissing? I'm not disagreeing with them that they're being vague, but at the same time, then then just don't be a little well, more careful because that's actually who's doing it is the theologians. I mean, I would argue that the Trinity is a great example of that. 
Right. So not a, bi- a biblical idea, yet one of the most widely held false doctrines uh, anywhere. In Christendom, quote unquote. Yeah. And it relies on those very documents that Mr. Butker is referring everybody to, these ambiguous and oddly worded ones that clarify <laughs> that right. c- clarify the Trinity, which is not... Like, if, if anybody read the Bible, uh, the, if you took an average person and they read the Bible, they would never get the idea of a Trinity out of it. E- e- even with some of the translating errors of the New Right. New. Given some of the ways translated by pro-Trinitarians, mm-hmm. you might have some questions, but you would not conclude that. That's That's exactly right. So... So for the younger listeners, a traditional Latin mass would mean that their their church service, which is mass, would be the the priest would deliver it in Latin. And you, you might think, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, one, who speaks Latin anymore? You know, you're going to sit there and basically hear a sermon that you don't understand. Um, I believe it was a strategy, an actual strategy that the Catholic Church employed, especially through the Dark Ages. Um, most people were... You know, most people didn't have money. They were peasants. They were they they didn't have a lot of money, and they certainly didn't know Latin. So here's what the Catholic Church is teaching and assuring them that this is what 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 the Bible teaches, and they can't they don't have any way because they, most people can't read, and they're hearing the Mass in Latin. And I think part of what spurred the Protestant Reformation seemed to be getting the Bible in languages that other people could 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 read. And you start to say, you start, people started noticing that what's being said, the traditional Latin mass didn't exactly match up with what was being told in the Bible. So, but to me, again, that was the kind of went hand in hand in, uh, you know, don't worry. So go, go to your priest, right? Well, your priest is going to, is in theory, if he goes to the TLM is, is preaching a sermon in a language, no, hardly anybody speaks. Right. And it adds to that sense of mystery and power and mm-hmm. awe. Mm-hmm. It's like, it, it comes across like a magical incantation if you don't know what's being said. And there's a reason in movies when they're trying to sound all mysterious that they'll often kind of, you know, kind of borrow and butcher from from the Latin. So getting into because we're well, we got about it's about 51 minutes, somewhere around 50 minutes. Mr. Robinson, well, I thought we turned to the prophetic. part. Yeah, no, let's. Uh, I thought we were in the prophetic. Oh, part. we probably are. Okay, good. Okay, so well, let me set you up with this because I this this is your thought, I think. So one of the things we both noted that was interesting was so there's several sub themes going on in this whole thing, and one was how much he was exhorting his audience to return to old school Roman Catholicism. Okay, what do you think he means by that, and what does he hope to achieve by getting more and more Catholics to kind of return to that mindset? That's, uh, that's, thank you very much. I, uh, good setup, Mr. Rob. In fact, like if I were a kicker, mm-hmm. you just pose that oh, right yeah. there. What do you call the, out and everything. What do you call the thing that you put the, the this ball is called, on? It's called the holder. The holder? Okay, it's nothing holder. fancy. Yeah. I thought there'd be, yeah. maybe a Latin term. Um, okay, here's the thing. I'm not trying to say Mr. Butker is the beast or the antichrist or any of that. Of course, he's just a passionate young Catholic and sincere. I hope it's plain. I, I think we, I think he and the people that applaud him, I think very sincere. But the fact is, here's what we know is coming. There is going to be a worldwide counterfeit Christianity of passion and of power that is going to be seeking to enforce a Sunday worship, that is going to be seeking to enforce religious laws, but not the laws of God, its own take on those laws. And if you read Satan's Counterfeit Christianity by Dr. Roderick Meredith, you'll know that we believe that, that is essentially the Roman Catholic Church, that it grows into that. It, it, the sign about Sunday, it all ties into that. But yet that that church has been struggling as of late. And we're, we're going to be speculative in this last part here, just so you know. It's been struggling. It, it's, it's, it's trying to compromise in some ways. Uh, people are frustrated with the current pope, including many Catholics, yep. very frustrated yep. with the current pope. And yet here you have a young man who has a zeal for the way he believes it should be, the way it used to be. And and the fact that it resonates with, with younger people and can offer something that personally, I think no other uh, Protestant, that no Protestant branch really can. Because if you're Episcopalian, I'm just picking one, or Baptist or whatever you might be, Presbyterian, and uh, Lutheran, you're trying to press people to go back to the church that Jesus Christ founded. 
for too many people, that's going to sound like the Catholic yep. church. It's them. Yep. I mean, really you look at Lutheranism coming out mm-hmm. in the 15, 1600s, you look at that. Then from there, even their own beliefs, they would believe that for the first millennium and a half of its existence, it was, you know, this church. Yep. And so pointing younger people that, you know what, life is messed up. You know what the answer is? It's the answer is the church we're a part of that Jesus Christ founded yep. 2000 yep. years ago. When it's not that, yep. it's, it's the it's the counterfeit. I think that's the kind of appeal yep. potentially that we'll start seeing yep. more and more in the future. Yeah, and, and one that seems to embrace traditional family values and, and is a pushback. I think he even says something along these lines. Um, he talks about the church needing to become more vocal about the degenerative social culture, mm. and that's where they're positioning themselves. And frankly, it's kind of understandable. Like some of this, this, you know, call progressive woke stuff that's been shoved down our throats for the last five plus years, people are getting tired of it. And then they're hoping somebody will stand up and say something about it. And of course, the church has always been there, but we don't get the audience that these other people do. And you and I have both seen people with some influence convert to Catholicism recently. As we noted earlier, there's been a lot of Catholic voices out there pushing against this. And you can see, you know, here's another quote from from Mr. Butker's um, speech. He said, society is shifting and people young and old are embracing tradition and they are positioning themselves. It would appear this why it seems prophetic to us because this goes with the other thing he said. He said, um, before we attempt to fix the issues plaguing the society around us, we must first get our house in order. And I think what he must mean by that, because he keeps saying it over and over, is going back and embracing traditional Roman Catholicism and going back to the TLM and all this kind of thing. And they position themselves as this like bulwark against degenerative culture and come be a part of it. And you could see how people would be attracted to that. You know, and I, and I have thought before just what you're saying and even other things like people worry about the islamicization say of europe that the the increase uh, the the growth of the influence of is the islamic religion in what was traditionally christendom if you will in europe that eventually i've wondered again we're we're speculating here towards the end and we're about to wrap up that some might think well you know what we, we have a religion. You know what? It's not, atheism is empty enough and secularism is devoid of value enough that it's just so hard to push back against yep. these passions, but that some might do what Pope John Paul said way ago is, is you know, discover your roots, yeah. remember yep. where you came from. And they might say, you know what? We can fight fire with fire. We've got strong traditions too. We want to reverse all of this, uh, our, our population implosion, the way they, uh, I thought very wisely referred to it in Canada. We want to reverse that. Let's go back to the doctrines where families were gigantic, you know, a bunch of good, large, quote unquote, you know, Catholic families. I think there's a real potential moment here. And I think in particular for the young who increasingly many of them recognize for all the values that some of some in their generation are pressing inclusivity, supposedly, and the rest, it's not really that they said, you know what, this is start, this is answers. This starts to be appealing. And that's why I'd like to highlight for, for our listeners that don't write off just his, we're not saying don't be zealous. Part of what actually I I kind of oddly enjoyed about his speech was here's a young person who recognizes, even if it's counterfeit, he doesn't understand that, the value of of ancient ways and and how satisfying it is to be connected to something that goes all the way back to to Jesus Christ. And something you feel is bigger than you. Yes. So I would, I would, try to encourage our, our listeners, our teens and our young adults. If anyone has a right to zeal like that, it's you. Your faith goes back 2000 years to Jesus Christ founding of the church. When you're sitting in services on the Sabbath and you're listening to the minister give a sermon, uh, when the holy days roll around, you are participating in something that Jesus Christ himself founded 2000 years ago. The, if you, if you're baptized as a young adult, the wine and bread you take has been taken by people for 2000 years that the zeal and passion that he has for a counterfeit Christianity is not something just to look at and think, Oh, well, you know, it's, that's not, not completely true. 
it's something actually I would say is an opportunity to examine ourselves. And so do I have that kind of zeal? God often in, in certain places would point to the Gentiles, to Israel and say, look, they, they're excited. Mm-hmm. What other people have you seen cast aside their God? No, they love their gods. They're excited. What's wrong with you guys? You know, why don't you? And I would take that as a challenge that if, if this fellow who doesn't truly know the truth can feel such passion for his faith, then I need to start searching my heart and making sure I've got a passion for the faith because the times that are ahead are, are going to need people of passion and, and there will be people that are ready to provide it. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think, so if I, if I concluded my thoughts on why, you know, whether this ends up being a true watershed speech or not, doesn't matter. I think what's interesting is the content and what he's, he's, hmm. he's, he's advocating for, he's exhorting a return to Roman Catholic Catholicism. And so then it's not too hard because of, you know, again, go look at our booklets about, you know what what we say about the catholic church and the man of sin and and those kinds of things um well let's uh, let's leave it at that the current pope is old and in ill health and so we're probably not that far away one way or the other from another pope and and can you imagine one that came on that was maybe kind of like had a, a more gregarious personality that was a little more and like galvanized those who want somebody to kind of push back at some of these right. degeneracy and like, it's not at all hard to see. And, 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 um, the, the dichotomy that was in our country in particular, but, but Europe as well between Protestantism and Catholicism, like that seems more tenuous than ever. And that the Protestants, it won't be hard. Hey, our churches aren't doing anything. At least the Catholics are. Let's return to the mother church. Right. Even, <laughs> even if for some reason, cause who knows how the details that will play out. But even if the the church, the Catholic Church, kind of embraced them without requiring them to mm-hmm. change a lot, they kind of did with the Anglican unions, yep. like, oh, your priests don't have to be not married like ours or something. And Mr. Hernandez likes to highlight; he's pretty free. He says, you know, uh, let him the first time he calls down fire from heaven. You know, it's like, whoa, you know, if you're yeah. already prepped for that, and let alone the guy starts doing some kind of miracle, you know, you've set the stage for exactly the kind of things we're looking yep. for. Yep. Sit and Robinson.